it. And all these questions. <laughs> and then we'll ask from the audience. But, but I try to begin. And the first question is, uh, to, I guess to everybody, <laughs> if you weren't a scientist, what would you do? Let's take, let's take a go around. That's the first question. No idea. Okay. I, I'd be a gardener. <laughs> You'd be a gardener. Um, I vaguely remember that I wanted to be a stewardess when I was 10 or something. <laughs> since I had a moment of dark confusion when I was an undergraduate in college because I took organic chemistry <laughs> and I didn't much like it. <laughs> so I thought about wandering off in some other direction. And then, um, you know, I, I contemplated photography, which I like very much. But... Um, Fortunately, a friend of mine convinced me that I should at least attend uh, one physical chemistry class. And I went, and it was like a little light bulb went off, and I said, oh, I love that. And, and then I never looked back. Well, I think one of my dreams has been to be um, the doing na nature photography. And I also had like a parallel career doing music, releasing an album and stuff. So I might have done that as well. My, my own sense is, uh, is that uh, being a scientist is a, a, an attitude about nature, a frame of mind. So I can't conceive of not being a scientist. <laughs> Though a way of the question life. of whether or not one's professional. So, yes. so I wanted to be a writer, actually, to write. Uh, I have lots of thoughts and write fiction and so on. So when I was 17, I got for one of my little articles, I got excellent, outstanding. So I thought, uh, here it is, but it was only once, never repeated. <laughs> <laughs> and I found out that writing is more difficult than science. <laughs> Hold on to that microphone. Uh, the next question is, uh, Ada, how has your life and work situation changed since you got the Nobel Prize? Did not. It means in the lab it's the same. I'm still running a lab. My lab in the family it's the same. With my friends it's the same. The only big difference, two only big differences, is the media that never didn't pay attention to me. Only as a joke when I <laughs> said that I'm going to do ribosomes, people laughed. So, but now they are running after me. And more important, I can meet people like you. <laughs> Young people, and that's, this gives me a lot of pleasure. So I hope that you also enjoyed me, but I enjoyed you tremendously, you and others. Um. <laughs> the, 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 the next question I, I think primarily is for you, Eric, though others can answer as well. Nikola Tesla was building a death beam, it says here. Can can't his technology be used for that, like Star Wars technology? <laughs> <laughs> well, as far as I know, death beams, first of all, they kill people, which is a bad thing. And secondly, they use electricity rather than producing electricity. I know there is this rumor that he produced this thing that would just take electricity from, from, you know, from air and from like the magnetic fields we have naturally, and that, that uh, research was cancelled. But since no one else seems to have done it and it's not working today, I, don't, I think that's more a rumor. I don't know if anybody else has an idea about it. I just want to say that if you have a moment, and you haven't, if you have a chance to read about Nikola Tesla, there's some wonderful biographies. He was such a fascinating person. And as an example of how fascinating he was, you know, he studied all the different kinds of electricity, and um, he, um, he didn't like drinking coffee in the morning. And so instead, he had a Van de Graaff generator. He would crank it up, and every morning he would put his hand on it and charge himself up so his hair would stand on it. And he felt a big charge, and then he went out into the world to make discoveries. <laughs> don't, don't try that at home. <laughs> I think the next question is pretty much to me. It says, what will you use instead of plastic to produce your uh, blood tubes when we run out of oil? Okay. <laughs> well, indeed, oil right now is, is the cheapest way to, to produce um, plastics, and I think as we cut back, we will recognize the value 
of using oil for lots more than just burning it. So, and I don't think we, in general, are going to run out of that type of material. That's just as we're not going to run out of coal. There are other reasons we want to cut back than, than depleting it. Uh, I must mention to you that every year I've been alive, someone has told me in the next 10 years we run out of fossil fuels. It isn't so. <laughs> okay. Let's go to the next question. <clears throat> What are your hopes about the scientists of the future generations? What's being asked here? Anybody want to comment on that? <laughs> Get busy. <laughs> no, uh, I think that you're coming into a period where the problems of society need science ever more and ever more. So the hope that we have is that you will stay engaged with science, each to make a contribution the best that you can, uh, because the world really has so many problems, so many that are so interesting and so deep, uh, that we really hope that you'll stay excited and that you'll you know, find a way yourself to contribute. I would wish for you one thing, and that is hope. <laughs> There is hope to change. We will manage, I think, that deep down. Because humans have been so creative uh, when we look back. We will manage, even if the problems now sometimes look severe, and I can imagine that many of you think, what's the purpose? And this really looks terrible. But I think we can come through and find new ways. I'd like to comment on that, if I might. Uh, think back, what, 200 years ago. Let's make it 1814. Let's look at the world in 1814, what it was like. Um, in 1814, the way that you traveled was primarily on land, was primarily animal power. It was horses and donkeys, pretty much. Uh, Camels and so forth. I don't mean to leave camels out <laughs> and so forth. Okay. And the way you traveled on the sea was wind power, by and large. Okay. Um, you did have the steam engine beginning to, to come, up, come up, but it wasn't taking a while to get it to you, be used. Uh, your, your water was unclean. The life expectancy was terrible. Okay. Not, not very long. Your food was also often poisoned. Uh, very hard, um, and you couldn't grow enough food based on how many people were being born, and people like Mal Malthus, Malthus had, had predicted that we were all doomed, okay? <laughs> and indeed, I think Malthus' prediction is right if there was no technology. It was, it was unsustainable. Well, we reached today another period which looks to us in many ways to be unsustainable, but I, don't, I think we will be able to go on and manage, but it will require us to put together science and engineering technology to make things happen. So I believe. Okay, I'm going to say two things. The first is that every generation has thought that all problems were solved <laughs> and there's nothing left to do. And so far, we've all been wrong. The science um, discoveries carry on unexpectedly and the world keeps changing. So I don't think that what faces um, your generation is any less exciting than, say, some of these sort of earlier golden ages, you know, the, the dawn of DNA or the dawn of um, quantum mechanics. I think there's everything still to play for. And the second is that as we do use resources more intensively, we need to understand what we're doing, and that does require the scientific citizen it really matters that we're all well informed. We work things out for ourselves and we say what's right and what's wrong. There are one or two glimmers of, ho of hope. If we look at what has happened with action taken globally to deal with the ozone hole, we have acted globally and it does look as though that's been fixed. But I see that as one of the, the big challenges that m maybe my generation has not taken as seriously and your generation will have to. 
I think regarding the, the scientists of the future, first of all, I hope some of those are you. Yeah. Um, we're seeing something that's pretty interesting that uh, when you're talking about the 1800s, something we could see pretty clearly then that a scientist, a researcher was usually like one person, usually uh, like an older guy. Um, <laughs> and that's an that's image of, of scientists, yes. like one person, like Nikola Tesla, whew, did it all himself. And what we see now that as we're facing these very complex issues, we need to uh, connect more to each other and use, like, we specialize in things, but we also need to communicate much more. So the, the scientist of the future is not one guy solving it all together. It's a guy and probably even more girls who are together working in, in large teams, as we see today in, in CERN, for instance, like thousands of people working together, um, interconnected. So remember that, like, don't only study your thing, remember to do the, the connection part. So when you go home, all remember to do Facebook and Twitter. It's very important for your future career. <laughs> and preferably you should do Facebook about this event. <laughs> the next question I have is, can you use the knowledge of ribosomes existence to, to provide tumors, cancer, and similar DNA faults? So I, I don't know when this uh, question was asked, but if after my lecture I doubt, I think that I didn't explain well. Ribosomes are making proteins. They are not talking to the DNA. They, are, they have only the transcribed DNA. However, until recently, we said, and I already, I also had a, a slide saying all ribosomes work the same way. And the idea was that in, in cells of cancer, uh, other, in other diseases, ribosomes are still the same. Now, recently, uh, recently, maybe the last 10 years, uh, maybe, maybe I'll, still, I'll, I'll say one thing on the side. When I started to work on the structure of ribosomes, there were about 10 papers a year that were direct interest to function in, stru in structure of ribosomes. Now there are 4,000. So, <laughs> I, I say it because it belongs to the previous like, uh, question, that there is a lot still to learn. So a lot still to learn about ribosomes is what actually happens to them or how do they function under non-normal non conditions. For instance, cancer cells. Cancer cells grow fast and only unlimited. Do the ribosomes take place in, do they, they act like this or just more ribosomes? We don't know yet. So it's a very good question, and whoever asked it, I wish you very intensive and interesting scientific life if you want to, un to answer this question. There seems to be two variations that, you're, that you, what you've said. Uh, one is that, is it not true that uh, not all proteins are made by ribosomes. There's some ways to make proteins that are not ribosomal, number one. Yes, in scripts they make them, okay. in the lab. <laughs> and the, the, the second question is, isn't it possible to somehow trick the ribosome into actually not using three letters, but using more than three letters? Work of that sort. What do you think of that? Well, uh, there are young people, usually young scientists, that want to do better. Whatever is done, better. So they try to make better proteins that will be less, less susceptible to uh, denaturation or to, to other problems. They, they try to use artificial amino acids. I talked about 20, actually there are 22. They are trying to make other, other ones. And they're also trying to make better ribosomes. So in terms of new amino acids that can be more useful for man, many human needs. Everything that can be stuck to the tRNA, this is the, the, the track that brings them, the ribosome will, will incorporate. The ribosome doesn't check once the codon is right, but there is a tunnel, and if the thing that is stuck to the tRNA is too large, it doesn't go through the tunnel, and it stops there. So there are now, I think, at least 10 non-natural amino acids. I don't know exactly why they are better, but they are being studied. <laughs> there are no 
non-natural ribosomes yet. I think we, as human beings, have to be a bit more modest and thank nature for the beautiful, the unexpected machineries that it builds, including ribosomes. Ribosomes not only make proteins, they also protect them, but also talk to the cells. If they are near membrane, they will produce the proteins that have to go through the membrane by interacting with the membrane, and so on. So this is still open, but to make a better ribosome, <laughs> hmm? maybe you tell me that I'm old and I don't, I'm not imaginative <laughs> enough, and I'm ready to hear it, but uh, I also interacted with many people, or they, many scientists that interacted with me and told me, oh, I tried to make a better ribosome and I could not. <laughs> <laughs> so even when you read or do, perhaps those that are in the labs, what is called cell-free expression of DNA. Cell-free is cell-free, but with ribosomes in the cell-free. <laughs> the next question, I think, involves Paul and Richard particularly. It's because crystals are one binding short of its edges. Does the boiling temperature vary between the center and the outer parts of the crystal? Oh, great question, great question. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> so first of all, uh, crystal is very small, so it doesn't normally have any temperature gradient across it. It's all at one temperature. The speed of sound is very, is, it, you know, is very fast. But, but it, the question is ideal because it is true that when you uh, heat a crystal up, um, there is, um, in, a, in a large crystal, um, you can have a distinct phase transition associated with the surface. Uh, and so there'll be a, a real change, a melting at the surface, and then ultimately a melting inside. In small crystals, nobody really knows, uh, because it's actually uh, quite hard to, to get good measurements on that. Although you could imagine ways potentially to do it, and people have thought about it a lot, but nobody's answered that question. So it's a really, really insightful, good question, and, and we shall see over time whether somebody finds a way to actually have a way to separate. Remember, there's uh, so much surface on one of those small crystals, and the interior part is so tiny, it's hard sometimes to differentiate what goes on at one from the other. So it hasn't been unambiguously determined. One, Richard? No. Fine. Okay. We turn to the next question. Oh, it's for me, I think. It's from Eric L Lindstrom. How would a super hydrophobic surface work in a blood collection tube, <laughs> would they be nearly as efficient and or easy to produce? Well, s the people have made things that are super hydrophobic, really repel water. They do this often by making indentations, making a morphology. Uh, I've seen lovely work at Brookhaven. I wouldn't be surprised your lab also does that type of thing, Paul. Uh, but it turns out being very hydrophobic is just not what you want with regard to blood because it then pulls out things from blood. <clears throat> the idea is to make it so that the surface is pretty neutral about what it does to blood, so it's not moving in the right direction. It's a way to make a good raincoat. <laughs> but it's a great hydrophobic. way to make a good raincoat, exactly. <laughs> okay, and, um, oops. Okay, this is for, for Eric. When you are speaking about applying this nanofilm on the mirrors to protect them from dust, it sounds like a very good idea. But isn't this film very vulnerable to outer forces, and is it very likely easy to break? And what about birds? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the birds issue you have, um, it's, it's, uh, it is actually an issue with, with CSP um, that they sometimes mistake it for um, a pond or some kind of reflecting film, so they will land on on the uh, on the heliostats and uh, you know, break a wing or something. And sometimes they will also go into because they have a very concentrated beam. <laughs> sometimes they fly into this beam and just disintegrate, <laughs> which is a bit sad. Oh, we're back to the death ray. I see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think wasn't it Archimedes who built the death ray? I think, yeah, something like that. Um, 
I don't. I can't answer the question about how. how I think that that film stays on pretty well. Maybe you know that better, Paul. Well, let me say this: that there's a lot of effort that goes into making dust-free solar cells, particularly in parts of the world that are desert-like, and there are many ingenious solutions to it. I don't think yet that anybody has found like the definitive one. But it does point to a theme of research, which is to make materials that um, fix themselves in different ways. And we're not very good at that. Nature does it constantly. <laughs> People don't do it very well. So if somebody is interested in becoming a person who makes artificial materials in the future, uh, that's something to try to think about as a concept. Is it possible to make a material that corrects something that goes wrong in it the way we just heard about how the ribosome corrects things even before uh, we would have known that it had happened? I mean, it's so amazing. When we make materials, they're kind of dumb. And so uh, that's a challenge for the future generation to learn how to make materials that correct themselves more readily. It's certainly possible. We see nature doing it. Yeah. We want a self-cleaning mirror. <laughs> that type of thing. <laughs> I, I have a question for those particularly interested in energy who've spoken. And, and it, it's a question I'm asking about if you would tell me today what percentage of energy in the world comes from what source. I think it would help everybody understand something about the nature of the problem we're talking about. I think I have some answer to that, but, but what answers do you have? Well, I think you saw my figure from United Kingdom. So the major sources are the fossil fuels and the, uh, in, to a certain degree, hydroelectric power in some countries. Okay, to, I, I think I know the percentages. What you mean? Do, you, do yeah. you know the percentage? I don't know all the percentages. I, I, they vary, but, uh, but like 40%. For, for, no, it's, no, it's much more like 85%. Yeah. Or 85 to 90% yeah. comes from fossil fuel. Globally, 90% of energy comes from fossil fuel. So I mean, that's, really that's by far the here. most. So, no. Yeah, if you no. include transportation, you know, all energy use, so, fossil fuel just by far dominates. So electricity generation the, it looks slightly more favorable, uh, where nuclear right. and biomass mm -hmm. and hydro and wind and solar make a contribution. And it may be as much as 20 or more percent that is non-fossil fuel. But electricity is only about a third of energy usage, and the rest is, is coal or gas or oil. Uh, you, are you, you you're speaking be... on the production side or on the consumption side? <clears throat> I, I was, well, the, 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 they match, yes. The, um, <laughs> for, for every kilowatt hour of electricity, we use in the West, we use another two kilowatt hours uh, or, or equivalent for driving our car or heating yeah. our home. Um, well, I was not thinking of, of mm. that. I mean, you use uh, coal or oil to produce electricity, so in that yeah. sense. But, but uh, I completely agree with you that uh, we cannot do without fossil fuels if that is the underlying question for the time being. So it's really going to be hard work to transform to another society where we can reserve the fossil fuel for clothes, plastic, whatsoever. <laughs> but as Eric said, there's enough energy out there. That's no question about that. But, but it, we have to do this over time. Yeah. I think we also have to remember that for loads of people on, on, on the globe, um, the main source of energy is biomass. So about, I think, I don't know if you, if you include, when we talk about 90% fossil, do you think you have at least 10% of the, of the total use of energy is biomass? So if you include that, it becomes a bit, um, the fossil use becomes a bit lower. Uh, and you, think, you have to think about it because there's so many people, like billions of people who use that as one of the main, main sources of, of energy. And uh, how do we get these people to, to go from there to either advanced biomass or to start using other sources like, like solar cells and similar? I, I thought you'd be interested to know that the figures I found out were that 3% of the world's production of energy comes from hydroelectric. And it is possible to imagine you can make a 33% increase to 4%. But you can't do much more, not, not with what's been done already in damming up various rivers. It's very hard, okay, <laughs> just to know. 
Well, maybe also just to say there, Dick, that um, I think you know by far most of our energy use does come from fossil, and I think if you, since many of you have been you know learning recently all about science and trying to understand it, one of the things that we always learn in biology at the beginning, even when we're typically in grade school and so on, is all the cycles. There's a carbon cycle and a nitrogen cycle and there's a cycle for water and all of these kinds of things. After a while, there's so many cycles, you begin to just think, oh my gosh, I can't stand it to see another cycle. <laughs> and yet, it turns out that this is the result of, of a system that has evolved to be stable to some degree, it still changes, but that also is planetary, global in its mm -hmm. scale, it has to be a cycle. And if you think about our energy use, we take all of this stored hydrocarbon and we only do half the cycle. We, we take the hydrocarbon and burn it to CO2 and water, which we then release. So it's exactly half of a cycle and then we stop. And now that people are operating on a global scale, we can't do half a cycle. We have to learn how to close it. Exactly. And to put it back to the initial state, that comes with an exergy cost. And that should be part of the price of the resource in the outset, how much it takes to put it back and be renewable then, or renew able to use again. So uh, all these calculations can be done. <coughs> and uh, w it will make a much fairer comparison between all the technologies. Uh, whether, if we can establish such a scale. And um, I agree that the solar energy, solar energy source is tremendous. Is, is, but there, the, the solar power plant, that is also an untapped uh, energy source. Everywhere where river water runs down into the sea, there is this potential energy of mixing, which compares to a waterfall of 100 meters, if we could take out all of it. And, uh, <laughs> but we don't, we just let the river go. So we have possibilities. Um, today, renewable energy is just a, is, is a pretty, f if, you don't, if you don't look at the, the biomass, but if you look at uh, solar, wind, etc., it's a pretty small share. But you also have to realize how fast things are happening with renewable energy. It's, it's exploding. Um, and one of the reasons is that traditional power has a, a certain dynamic. It's, it's pretty, st not, the, you don't have that much happening. You know, the, 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 the engines look more or less the same as they did 100 years ago. It's a very slow development. And because of this, people who work with NED don't understand solar, because solar works more like, like computers and cell phones. Um, you know, a computer, you know, every 18th month, uh, the computer gets, uh, has twice the capacity. And it's more or less the same thing with, with a solar, solar cell. For every doubling of, of capacity of installed solar cells, the price goes down 20% which means every year the price goes down and you can install more and more and more. Um, in one year, Germany managed to install um, about 10 gigawatts of, of solar cells, which is a, a, like the whole, the capacity of all nuclear plants in Sweden, in one year. And the, the plant that I was showing, the, the e-solar plant, they went from, from nothing, from, from like a drawing board to, to making a company and making a plant in five years. I mean, there's no way you can build a nuclear plant that, that quickly. So things are happening very, very fast when it comes to renewable energies. And you have to see this, that even if it's a small share today, the capacity, the, the potential is huge with these exponential growth curves. So that's, that's very promising, actually. Uh, another question. Could you store the sun cell energy in a similar way that plants do, since they can store the energy in an effective way over the night without the sun shining on it? Is it possible to produce a similar process from Nina Asadi? I think you already said that. You store it in, as a latent heat in the salt, which you, if you melt the salt, you can take back the enthalpy of melting when you cool it again. 
Um, but that's not the only way. <laughs> yeah. an, an, another way is to use uh, power to gas, in which you take electricity and then you, you, take, uh, you, you capture carbon dioxide from a process that emits carbon dioxide. You take that carbon dioxide and using that, that uh, source of electricity, you, you add hydrogen atoms to, to it, uh, protons, so it becomes um, natural gas, methane. Um, that's also a way of storing energy. And uh, you can produce uh, a chemical? And some of you, I think yes. you mentioned it. You can produce hydrogen, which you can use later for fuel cells whatsoever. Yeah, I'd like to make a comment about this because I, I'd like to put this in the context of um, the, the history of thermodynamics, if you like, uh, because I think there's an important way. It is a great question, by the way, and it's, it's clearly one of the big challenges is to make this actually work. But think about it like this. The simplest way to use the sun is to just heat something up. It becomes hot. And um, as you'll learn as you study thermodynamics, that's a kind of a, um, uh, almost a lowest form of available energy. <laughs> so the next way is to use the photoelectric effect to make a quantum of excitation that promotes an electron to a higher potential energy, so it's not heat anymore. So it's a higher form of energy that lets you do more with it, okay? A next higher form that you will invent, we hope, <laughs> will be to take those electrons at that higher potential energy and use them to rearrange chemical bonds. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you are changing the entropy of the molecules. If you take CO2 and water and you make a hydrocarbon, you're making those atoms all come very close and be very ordered compared to what they were before. This is what nature does in a plant. It makes complex molecules. It takes light, CO2 and water, simple molecules, and light takes the energy of the light to make a complex molecule, even as complex a one as a ribosome, enormous entropy, way, way out, complex, uh, you know, uh, system. That is the challenge that we face, is to learn to make a thermodynamically more advanced solar energy. And this is something which we're almost able to do, but not quite practical yet. And so this is a thing that you can learn to do. And, and, and you had the question about how are you going to get your plastic uh, professors here in the future. <laughs> the answer is probably we're going to use CO2 water and sunlight, and it's going to make, we're going to learn to make complex molecules like plastics. That's your, that's your challenge, is to help learn to do that. Indeed, indeed. Um, can you create um, an antibiotic that's effective against gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria? <laughs> I cannot make any antibiotic. <laughs> <laughs> I can only provide uh, tools, structural tools and information for whoever, for chemists and companies that may, may make. The, the best I can do is to modify something that is uh, already existing. Still, I won't do it. I don't have a lab to do it, but I can collaborate with somebody. So gram negative, gram positive, there is a big difference between them. But I don't have the tools for either. OK. Um, to produce the containers to absorb solar energy, You'll need energy to make the, the machines. Will the energy the machines create be equal or hopefully better more than the energy it took to make the whole solar plants? Yeah, easy question. 30 times. <laughs> so uh, if you have a plant where it operates for 30 years, it'll take one year to, to pay back uh, what it took to, uh, uh, to build it. OK. Yeah, that is in economic terms, then, but do you... In energy terms. In energy terms. Thank you. <laughs> and the uh, last question I have is, do you think that it would be possible to combine all of your ideas to reach an optimal solution? <laughs> That's your question. <laughs> <laughs> I think we also need some more ideas we haven't even thought of well, yet that you're going to think of. <laughs> And you, I, I, must, I must, again, end in a way by telling you about the power of the question. Never mind about the answer. You've heard the answers. We're, we're getting signals. Yes. More questions. More, questions. more not in here. Well, one more. Wow. 
Okay. <laughs> Uh, can I just answer the, the first the question that was there? Um, I, I think it's pretty important actually to say that, like um, which which technology is the best, and it's mm -hmm. not really about that. I think we need to you work with all these technologies. We we cannot foretell the future. I cannot say my technology is better than your technology because we don't know. Nobody knows. If we knew, I'll, I'll be investing all my money mm -hmm. into it. Something you know. Um, Someone else would. So we don't know, we, we cannot foretell the future. We have to work with everything. The most important thing is that we do that. We invest money in, in you know, green tech and new innovations that solves problems. Uh, and that we, that we you know, work as researchers with this. Uh, and that we're open for the, the possibility that we have lots of different technologies working together, filling different niches. Yeah, I, I think it's important to realize uh, that the future of technology um, isn't like the past. The past, you just hear about the winners, and it appeared to be entirely obvious what was going to happen. The future is, is wonderfully uncertain. And you had sort of three different views on how says. to use the, the energy from sunlight oh, today. Okay. I think to each you. of us believes yeah. that our solution is the best. Um, but we don't know. Um, and that's, that's what makes um, research and technology, uh, and technology such, uh, such a great thing to do. But it is very important that we work on all the technologies and we have de because they have dedicated use. The solar cells, they are standing there. They cannot be used in the city where the car has to operate. So there we need uh, fuel cells, different things. People in Africa have different surroundings, different uh, uh, temperatures than we up in the Arctic. We need different solutions. We have to invent all these dedicated uh, high efficiency systems. More questions from out there? Yes, let's get a microphone to this person. <laughs> okay, so I want to ask a more general question to all of you. I'm just in love with the amount of curiosity you guys have, and it's just so great to see how passionate you are for your subjects when you're talking. And I think uh, this curiosity is really what drives the human civilization forward. So I'd like to ask, how do you guys think you get more people motivated to be this curious, and how do you get children to keep their inner curiosity that they have when they're small? <laughs> Well, ch change the school system to start with. I mean, we, ha we have a school system. They change the school system. They have this test they put on, like, how creative are you? Uh, and it's basically the test is like, um, to, to put it simple, like, you, you, they give you, they tell you an object, and you can say like different ways of using this. And if you score over a certain level, like several hundreds, you're, you're considered a genius. And only a few percent of, of, of like grown-ups, of normal people, score as genius. While about 80 percent of people, like you know, small kids, score as as super genius, as with 500 points. Mm -hmm. So something happens when you go through the school system, um, which is built somewhere, you know, in, in the 19th century. To, to fill a need, and it's very different today. So we have to start thinking about how to change, how to change the school system and how we talk about things uh, in the public debate. You know, have, have the media have it focusing, or, or our interest focusing more on, on these issues, because there's so much out there to learn. And I, I think it's happening through social media. Like I see all my friends sharing like science news, Maybe that's only me, but I, I see things are happening out there and that there is an increased interest. So I'm positive about this. One of the things that I think um, society gets wrong is to regard science and engineers as just sort of doing routine um, things, sort of like um, sorting out the, uh, the plumbing. And, uh, and society doesn't sort of categorize science and engineering as being creative. So if you, um, I have a colleague uh, in the UK who designed the computer architecture in the microprocessor that all of you have on you, if you've got a phone, an ARM processor. Um, and when he's asked at parties what he does, he says it's in the creative industries. <laughs> so I, I, I'm, I'd like to build on what's been said 
and to remind you about the character Peter Pan. I don't know if that's known well in Sweden or not, but I think Peter Pan had it right. Don't grow up, okay? <laughs> and, and I mean it, you, you, you get older, you can't stop that, but you don't have to grow up. And this certain, I'm talking about childlike, not childish, childlike wonder of the world. Keep it, you were born with it, use it, and, uh, and find something that you really love, that you're passionate about, and you will have a wonderful life. That's my advice that way. Yes, don't grow up. <laughs> but <laughs> you do grow up. <laughs> and uh, when I meet a student, I, I find it always so fascinating. I ask myself, so how is this person going to be? And how is this Dr. Sisi is going to be? You never know up front. And <laughs> that's always so interesting after four, three, four years to see um, how uh, it came out. But, but you have to allow people to be wrong. You have to allow people to <coughs> do mistakes. My colleagues here have said that. I mean, it's all about doing the wrong experiment and learning from it. <laughs> and, and do we uh, allow pe uh, children to be wrong in our society enough? I, maybe that's where it is. I think that, mm, I think I'm, I'm trying to have this level where, uh, in, of communication where there is no such thing as a stupid question. Uh, because if we can uh, speak freely and out of your mind, then suddenly, oh, that's a good idea. But uh, if you feel like, oh, I, I think I have to live up to this standard or this and that, then you don't do that. You bind yourself. I think that by nature, people are curious. And this shows mostly when people are young, like children, because they are not yet taming themselves to fit into some type of uh, society, school, parents, whatever. So uh, if we let kids do what they think they can explore, what they like to explore, and not make them constantly afraid that the teacher will not like it, and the, the grade will be lower. They can be friendly with the teacher. I have nothing against that. But they should be <coughs> free to answer questions the way they want without uh, worrying about how the world will take it. And I think that the, the, this is, if, if the teachers and the parents and the society adapts this idea, we can change the school system and we can make better teachers, but we should keep the curiosity of children when they grow up to be youngsters and above that. I think you also have to remember that uh, creativity and, and like mental ability is something you have to work for as well. I mean, there's nobody, I don't think there's anybody in here who thinks you can get super fit by just you know, lying in a sofa watching TV. <laughs> but we do have a perception that you can do this. You can do a similar thing with your mind. You can just, you know, if you're just smart, you can just sit around, do nothing, and then you, you'll keep on being smart. But that's not really the case. I mean, you have to work on this. Creativity is something you can you can work with actually improving. You, know, you, you, can, you can do lots of things to improve your creativity, and you can you have to work with your, your mental abilities and your intellect all the time to actually to to um, to keep it and, and to, um, to deepen it. So that's, that's also something you have to remember that don't take it for granted and, and work with it. Use your creativity and, and develop your creativity. One additional ingredient. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Go for it. Um, just one additional small thing I would say, which is it's very, very important to have uh, great respect that each human being is capable of doing something very special no matter where they come from, what their background is, whether they're a man or a woman, whether anything about them, each person has this tremendous capability to contribute. And so many times, um, because of one specific interaction or because of one or something that we have a preconception on, 
we, we, we think that somebody else is not going to be able to contribute and we treat them badly in a way that convinces them that they can't. And if that happens enough times, then somebody kind of withdraws and doesn't do what they're capable of. <laughs> so it, there's the macro, let's get the schools right, and all that. but then there's the micro. Every personal interaction matters. Thank you. Question over here. I see. Uh, if we could bring a, a microphone. Eric, you were earlier speaking about this uh, self-cleaning surface to put on the reflecting mirrors in the desert uh, to avoid uh, the enormous usage of water. And, but as far as I understood, you needed water to start the self-cleaning process. So if you're not supposed to use water from own sources, how are you supposed to start the cleaning process? Yeah. That's a great question. <laughs> uh, so the answers are uh, twofold. One, people make technologies that just have small amounts of water that's fed in and you just try to minimize it. But the more interesting one, is uh, to th think about this idea. Imagine that we had a material which at night <laughs> condenses water out of the atmosphere and then uh, you know, later on can release it. Uh, that's actually very achievable. Even in the driest desert, there is enough water in the atmosphere uh, to collect uh, out and then to release it to use for cleaning and in fact even to do other things with. And this is a challenge to invent a material which will have just the right binding energy for a water molecule that it, that temperature difference will be enough to capture it and then release it and also have the right surface area. And, so, and people are trying to do that. So you are exactly on the right uh, track there to think of a material that could have that property. I should also say that from the start, water is part of the problem. Uh, because f first of all, you, you yes. do, as you said, you, you do have water there, um, and it, it creates dew on on the the surfaces, which re uh, reduces the reflectivity. So you do have natural water. Um, you also have a problem that it does sometimes rain out there, and when it does, um, <laughs> it it will like you have these organic materials depositing on your mirror. Uh, so when it rains, it cannot these materials will clog, um, and then so they kind of um, so d d dissolve in, in, in the water. And then w when the water evaporates and the sun starts baking, they'll bake into the mirror. So that's part of the problem is that you do have water there that does a lot of things to your mirror. So by this kind of surface, you want to remove that problem. I, I was going to suggest that there's a way around it, which is to have lots of water, and to, which is to run reverse osmosis with all this cheap electricity produced from the solar <laughs> thermal plant. Um, because, of course, sunny places where there are no clouds um, are short of water. Um, and it, very interesting deployment of uh, reverse osmosis around you know, large parts of the Arab world, um, probably in North Africa in the future. So fresh water is a very valuable commodity. And you can treat fresh water produced by de desalination as stored energy, um, put it into the overall mix of um, of energy storage. Um, it, can, it can be uh, desalinated during the day and it doesn't go away overnight. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. A question way over there that I see. Uh, this is a question to Eric. Uh, how big is the area you would have to cover with solar panels to provide the world with power it needs. Uh, how, how do I power the, the, the heliostats? Well, they're all... No, I mean how big the area has to be that you have to cover, cover with these panels. Isn't it going to be too big? Um, well, you have to take a, um, a decent share. I don't remember the exact figure now, but we're talking uh, for Sweden, it would be... Um, 20 times 20 kilometers that you have to cover, where the desert. Um, so for the whole globe, um, it will be in the region of some tens, uh, some hundreds times some hundreds kilometers. 
Um, so if, if you look at it in a map, it's a little dot over the desert, and you would have to spread that out uh, pretty evenly over the desert. And, and or again, like you wouldn't cover the whole like global um, energy demand with this. It's, it's a part of, of an energy mix. You would you have, you'd have many different solutions to it, and this is just a part of it. And, and the most important thing is that it's probably more expensive than, than PV cells, but it's, it will help stabilize your systems. You need, you need like maybe 10, 20% of CSP to stabilize your system and provide electricity when the PV cells are not working. I just want to reinforce that comment that, that you know, <coughs> They're probably, you know, it's very unlikely that there'll be one way that we get energy. There are going to be multiple ways. And, and one of the amu amusing ways of thinking about this is the so-called uh, gigaton throwdown. So in a gigaton throwdown, you think about, uh, you try to think about energy solutions that could potentially become up to one gigaton of carbon, where maybe, um, you know, there's uh, 12 or so that get emitted every year for, by people, and maybe it will grow to 20 or something as time goes on. So if you could do 5% or, you know, if you, if you think about a technology as a chance to get to 5% of global energy use or something like that, it's already extremely, extremely interesting and worth thinking about. And, and, and sometimes people have, uh, at my lab, for example, sometimes uh, the National Lab, there'll be a competition to think about, you know, a gigaton throwdown. Okay, let's everybody come together and try to think about what are the ways, what are the ways that we could think where you might come up with a spare gigaton here or there in the future. You know, that, that, then that stimulates people to think on the right scale, but not to think, oh, it's the only answer. Well, I see we, we are now losing people in, in the back. And, and <laughs> you're pointing to something. I, question. Yes. OK, I have a question for that I would like to have an individual answer from every one of you. and. Uh, after what you said today, what will be the most useful solution or energy solution that will be more effective here in Sweden? I mean, if you're thinking of the, the season and the, the temperature when it gets cold in winter and uh, even the weather itself. I, no, I didn't, I didn't really get... <laughs> I, so, think you, I think you've stumped the panel. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay let, me say, let, let me say it again. Uh, what would be the most useful energy solution here in Sweden? In Sweden? Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. Um, again, we're talking about a mix. Uh, what we're doing now is we're building lots of wind power, which I think is a pretty good idea. I think an optimal mix for Sweden. Um, Let's say I'm a government, re government representative now, but so don't take everything I say literally. This is my personal <laughs> opinion. <laughs> um, so I think a good mix uh, is wind power, hydropower, and bioenergy. Um, so how it works is that um, the wind power is, is, highly, is highly fluctuating. So sometimes it proves a lot, sometimes it doesn't. So it, that and it, it's a great source of, of of energy. We can get a lot of, of energy that way. So, but we need to know how to balance that. Um, so first of all, we need interconnectivity with other countries. They can help us balance. Um, the hydropower is already very good. That's what we use today to balance our grid. Um, and what we more to do more is that we need to expand the bioenergy and we need to use it more cleverly. So, for instance, when when the wind is producing a lot, we can take um, we can reduce the um, the output from bioenergy plants uh, and reduce the amount of bioenergy used in our district heating systems. And you can pump, some, maybe some, if there's a very you know, a large amounts of wind energy, you can pump some of that energy into the district heating system and use that as a storage because storage in, in heating is, is more efficient or more cheaper than storing, storing electricity. And then when the wind power goes down, uh, you would you know, pump up the, the output of, of hydropower and, and bioenergy plants. So it's, it's a mix there of different systems and how to work those together in an optimal way. S solar will also be there, but like, we have some of the worst conditions in the world when it comes to <laughs> solar power. 
so it will be there, but the problem is it produces too much in the summer and too little in the winter. So it'll, it'll be a, a share, a, a part of the solution, but it will not be the whole solution unless we solve you know, the battery problem or, or some very Energy efficient storage. way of storing electricity. The others agree? So Eric talked about the supply side, but we should also think about the user side. So we are the users, everybody. So we should also be conscious on how, what we ask for. We should install heat pumps in our houses instead of just, uh, as in uh, my ridiculous Norway, put the electricity directly into the <laughs> heating system. Um, and uh, he, I know my colleagues in Sweden have heat pumps. <laughs> so, and, uh, and the way we uh, use energy, we should bicycle, we should use public transport, we should do, uh, be as conscious as possible, sorting our garbage and all this stuff. Yeah, boring, but necessary. And fair. And why shouldn't we do it? The next person. I mean, I'd like to have an uh, individual answer from all of you. <laughs> so, yeah, Paul. About Sweden? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, 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 so I think what you've heard is, uh, you know, somebody who has studied Sweden a lot, that sounds like a, different countries will have, a, you know, um, Singapore and uh, China and Sweden and the United States and so on will each have a very different energy picture. They do today, and they will going forward as well. So there, you know, there won't be one. You know, one for Sweden. I think what you just heard doesn't sound unreasonable because there's already lots of hydroelectric. The wind is growing very, very quickly, and that technology is is you know is getting better over time. So that sounded like a pretty plausible scenario to me. But it's very hard to judge these things. Um, and what you have to realize is that in the end, you study these things the most that you can. And typically, if you're a scientist, there's this magical moment where you make a bet. <laughs> and it's a very important moment where you decide to fight for something. <laughs> uh, and you, know, you remain objective. You recognize it may not turn out to be the one that wins. But you decide, I care enough about this one. I'm going to try to see if I can take it as far as I can. And that's, that's a, you know, th th you do that based on your best reading of what the circumstances are and the opportunity. But then you also just have to fall in love with something and decide, oh, this is the one that I'm going to chase. So, so you know, we could say all we want up here. But in the end, you have to decide that there's something that you want to chase and that you could be excited about. Well, Sweden has one big advantage, which is the amount of hydropower that it's got. And I, um, it was mentioned that with hydro, uh, you, you really can turn it on and off whenever you want, very quickly. So it's a wonderful way to balance when the wind drops, if you've got wind power. Um, you can, if you want, pump water uphill uh, if you've got some excess energy, and then it's ready to use when you need it sometime later. So, so actually, uh, the sort of balance of resources that Sweden has got, maybe a bit less on solar, but plenty of hydro, is, is very attractive. There's a question way in the back of the room that we'll need a microphone for. In this modern era of civilization, the use of plastics is increasing every day for our society. And we are involved in plastic world around us, and it's increasing every day. So there are a lot of plastic waste also after we use them. So what could be your possible solution to create a green future tomorrow? From, pla from replacing plastic's point of view? Uh, I think it would be re really important, and people are working on this, to produce a biodegradable plastic, uh, one, one which can be returned to uh, the earth in a good way. 
I don't think it's just a question about plastic. I think it's a question of all the materials we use, and we need to get used to understanding what the entire life cycle is of a material we, we use. Very good. I agree. <clears throat> I think it's been a very rich day, and I'm very grateful to Chalmers Institute of Technology for making this possible for us to have this meeting here. And I'd like to ask Dina if you'd like to say any closing words. I'll give you the microphone. Careful. Uh, careful. <laughs> <laughs> Not funny, actually. <laughs> I would like to thank everybody. I would like to thank so much all the guests and all the speakers who have been with us here today. And I'd like to thank Dick also for taking the role for being a convener for the discussion. I would like to extend my special thanks for all the students who remained all the way until the end. I know it has been a long day. And thank you for participating, and thank you for asking relevant questions. Actually, I haven't heard a single dumb question, either during the breaks or during the discussion. It has been really great. You are asking relevant questions that are the challenges that we face, that you are facing, and your children, and your grandchildren. So keep the motivation high, because this is actually what you need. You can be more smart, less smart, you know, that's biology. But the fact that you care, is what actually is going to drive you forward. So thank you very much, and have a wonderful evening, and I hope to see you at our next events. Bravo.